Um, that's Paul's introductions. Hello, um, I'm Andy. Uh, I work at Housestrip in the UK. Uh, it's a family focused build up holiday thing. Yes, it's really like Airbnb. Less couches, more actual bedrooms. Um, I live in Brighton on the south coast, so I work remotely in London. Um, I run Brighton Ruby Conference. You should come, it's lovely. I'm here speaking, Sarah Allen is speaking. Uh, that's in July, for those of you who fancy a trip to the English Riviera. Um, and these are my twins. These are the reason I probably shouldn't have run the conference last year because they're two years old and absolutely exhausting. Um, right, active job. Who knows what active job is? Show of hands, please. Not that, but half. Uh, who has actually used it in an app? Mm, less? Okay. So, from the recent release notes of Rails 4.2, uh, it's our most recent Rails code baby. Uh, new code is good code, as we all know. Um, so, okay, there's another way of asking the same question. So, who here has a Rails 4 app in production? Who has a Rails 3 app in production? Who has a Rails 2 app in production? My people! Yeah. Um, who's got a Rails 1 app in production? Not you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so for us, for those of us in our day jobs who are perhaps a little behind the curve of the uh, Rails edge, um, this is something to look forward to in the future. So it's a stable interface to a bunch of queuing systems. So when you want to get work out of the request response cycle, um, say sending email or doing something computationally expensive, so you can, it's a sort of a generic front end to delay job, uh, if you're old school, um, Resk or Sidekick or any of these, these other excellent queuing solutions. Um, it looks like this. Um, pretty straightforward code. If you've written any asynchronous jobs, they all somewhat take this path. Um, do a bunch of stuff, then do the web request, basically. Um, here's the interface that you would call it with. Uh, you get a perform now and a perform later method for free. Uh, and when you're using perform later, um, you can give it a time to do it out or a time to delay before you actually execute the job. Because Rails is nice and the core team loves us very much, there's also extra stuff. Um, so it powers action mailer, so action mailer, every action mailer instance that you use uh, can be delayed, which is a good thing. You know, you know, many of us are using external services to send email, so it, it makes sense to take it out of the press response cycle in case that service is you know, down or slow or whatever. Um, you also get new hotness, global ID. Uh, whereas if you've written jobs before, you might have done this sort of thing, where you pass in the ID of the thing you're trying to do work to. Uh, and then inside the perform job, you would make a standard act to record look up, and then you do the slow stuff. What a global ID lets you do is that. So you pass in and it automatically goes and looks up based on act of record magic. I'm not going to go into the details about that, how it does that. But you can use that all that time that you saved. So I'll watch the Force Awakens trailer again. So, just get that. so that's awesome, isn't it? In summary, a very good thing. Uh, very Railsy uh, means you can change out your queuing system, which I know is something that we all do, you know, every five minutes. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good idea. It's pretty. You know, it's paving the cow paths. Which is uh, something that I'm saying. I don't know if that's it. <laughs> Um, all right, complete change of tack. Um, as a community, we have been having relatively interesting and heated discussions um, about the architecture inside our Rails apps, um, including sort of the rise of the understanding of, say, service objects. To me, a service object is simply an object that executes a particular piece of business logic that you want, for whatever reason, Keep out of the active record walls. Um, we'll get talk of hexagonal architectures, and decorators, and presenters, and form objects, and components, and cells, and blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm going to sit on my stool now. A lot of the problems I've seen in sort of legacy apps, such as the one that I work on, uh, one, ones that I have worked on, ones that I've created myself, um, is mostly related to 
more fundamental design decisions, you know, bad data models, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not pointing fingers because we've all done it, I've done it, you've done it, it's fine. Um, you know, as software ages, you get better understanding of your domain, so you spot your mistakes. So, I'm not a guy who's going to service object everything. You do see you know, various programs. This is my really, really great framework on top of Ray. I'm like, look at this, quite a lot of framework already. Um, however, I'm also not against putting stuff in not active record models. I'm sort of anti-dogma. I'm friendly. I love everybody. It's great. Um, uh, in case Aporo is a plain old Ruby object, some of you will be familiar with the, uh, with the terminology. It's just a Ruby object, but you put it in the Rails app, so it gets a special name. Um, uh, service objects are a particular kind of, I think a sort of way of using a plain Ruby object in your, in your code. It's all, you know, uh, plain old Ruby objects are also quite useful uh, for wrapping concepts that perhaps aren't database backed. Some people use things like form objects or uh, wrapping external libraries is something that I quite like to do. You, know, you might abstract away your, um, your particular uh, choice of net HTTP wrapper. So if you want to wrap Faraday, you want to wrap HTTP party or whatever. Um, for me, I like to sort of wrap that in something else that gives me an internal API that I control. Uh, that means I'm not sort of making calls to other gems all over the moment. Just an aside, really. Okay. So if you're going to use a service object, when might you try and use one? Um, as I said, it's a complex doing stuff object, which is very technical. Um, so if it's a complex thing, if you're going across multiple active records, models, uh, like I said, an external service is often a useful concept if you're going, you know, pulling out to an external service. Um, if it's a tangential to storing data as well. Um, so there's a link on the bottom of this slide just to a really great article from actually a couple years ago now. Um, and he covers a lot of sort of ways to decompose your Rails app in a sensible way. And the best thing about the article is it kind of says, this is a good idea when to do this. You know, it's not, it's anti-dogmatic, which I think is a, a really useful thing to do. Um, conventions that you typically see in apps where service objects are in effect, uh, you end up with, you know, they're typically named after verbs. You know, do the, you know, like I said, do stuff object. So accept an invite, for example, in the examples I'm about to show you. Um, there's typically one public method per class. So you sort of pass all the stuff in you want to the object, call a single method, and it goes off and does the list of things that need to happen. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward. So here's an example um, of a style that I've personally used. Um, I'd be, uh, the concept I've used here is for accepting an invite. We're presuming that accepting an invite is really slow in your system for whatever reason. Um, so you call accept on, on the invite model, do some logging, because uh, the, the business wants to know what's going on in your app, which is me, um, and it sends a couple of emails. So this is probably a good thing to separate it out. Um, I've seen this style where you use a struct, so you don't have to write the initialize method. Um, as you can see, it's the same, you know, it's called the run method, but it's the same, the same again. Here's a slightly more java style one because they've got the name service on the end of the object. Um, and equally, you can see there's a you know, injection of things up there that, for me, this, this is probably over complicated. Uh, here's one using, uh, here's a style I've seen where they uh, use call because uh, you, can, you can then invoke the uh, service, service object without actually giving a method name. Yeah, I'm sure that's not really my bag, but of course you can do this. Um, so we've seen, you know, there's different conventions that people use and they typically agree with your team um, or with yourself if you're working on your own. Um, so you've got things like the, mo the methods called run or process or call, um, you know, whatever you want to call it. You know, sometimes people use the, you know, they might use it, accept, invite, dot, accept would be the name of the method, perhaps. And there's one more, um, this one. So this is very similar. Can you see anything interesting? Ooh. <laughs> now, the point of the talk becomes clear, one hopes. Um, I'm actually 
think we've learned two things. One that Andy does eventually have a point, and the other thing is that Keynote's the only place where skeuomorphism lives inside a inside apple. Look at that, look at this again. Ooh. Um, right. So my point kind of is, why not use the pattern that we're being given by this new active job to do all services stuff? Um, and I guess my other point is, is this just another way that DHH is trolling us when he says he doesn't like service objects? Because <laughs> this is his fake. Um, is he trolling us? Was he trolling us yesterday? We will never know. So a quick rerun of our why services slide. So the action is complex. It reaches across multiple models. Maybe an external service. It's not a core concern of the underlying model. Also trick more information. There you go. It's also true for jobs. And again, the conventions that I've seen from services uh, can also be true for jobs. So that's where we're meant to put active job objects in app jobs. Uh, they're typically doing stuff. There's typically one method per class, one public method. Um, they do typically do one business thing. And yeah, there's a freebie you get. You can think about them asynchronously or synchronously. Now, obviously, this make all your service objects into jobs thing is probably going to have some edge cases. But um, I have a couple of apps that I'm working on, like toy apps, just to play with stuff. Um, and it seems to work pretty well. Um, this is all Rails is great for. Like, it's for solving the not edge cases. It's the 80% that you do all the time. It seems like a really good pattern that we can reuse. Um, it's just interesting that Active Job might have solved something that it didn't realize it was solved, but one of us are already doing. So, um, so I'm a relatively quick talk, so you can go off and try casting for something else. <laughs> um, having shown you this jobs as service objects things, um, I've got a few things I'm going to carry on. Um, in all of the examples I showed you, um, this is probably the pattern that would have happened. This is sort of the final pattern I got for accepting you invite. So in your controller, you end up with accept invite, perform now, perform later, doesn't really matter. Um, pass in the invite, pass in the current user, and then you read all the summaries. And then the work actually gets done by a worker off to the side somewhere outside of the request. What I'd probably do is that. I probably actually wouldn't put this in. Um, now, I know our controllers are meant to be really, really skinny. We're sort of like, we're not, we're not big on fat controllers. Um, we're not big on fat models now either. So now we have service objects where everything goes. Um, at some point, you can't really get away from a controller action being a list of stuff to do. So I guess, yeah, it sometimes it's nice to have it in one place. I mean, some of the issues that we've been dealing with, uh, with our own personal darling legacy model is, um, is the is that patterns like service objects have been applied because that was the new thing to do, and so you end up with the, the action implementation of stuff being well away from where it's called. You, know, you might get two or three level levels of indirection. And you're jumping around VM if you're cool or Atom if you're not cool, like me. Um, just trying to find out where the code is doing the thing that it's actually doing. So, and what's funny is there's a talk downstairs right now. Um, about controllers being just controllers, and I'm presuming that this is where he's going to get to as well. So it's obviously a clear message that we and Justin have worked out together. Um, this isn't going to work if you want to service, service object everything. Um, or apply your own custom Rails framework on top of Rails. Um, in my experience, a recipe for bad code is trying to apply ceremony and structure way too early. Um, be clear, use defaults, don't pre-optimize. Um, it's, it's best to wait for the pain before you start applying strong methods. Rails is really good for taking stuff out of the database and making good pages. Sort of decided, that shouldn't be a news way, but often we forget that it's really good at that and then we start applying like very strong patterns to it. Um, so perhaps this way of thinking it's just worth going, because if you can then think of a service object like a job, like something that you might take out of the response, 
you know, the, the web request response uh, cycle. Is this worth putting in the job? It's probably a good question to be asking yourself to help you with the structure of your controllers and the overall structure of your app. Or whether it's just clear you know where it is, you can control it. So I'm going to leave you with this. Do not pre-optimize. This is the biggest weakness I see in myself, like every time I go back and look at my old code. Like we're mostly clever people. <coughs> Most of us, you know, not to blow our own trumpets, but you know, we're pretty much a fairly bright bunch. Um, we should stop trying to prove it to everybody else. <laughs> well, let's, let's stop making things better in case or providing super flexible architectures and any of that stuff. Some of the nicest things you can do are to play nicely with Rails' defaults. Their defaults, you know, that's the whole, the whole point of Rails was, you know, we're doing the things that everybody's doing already. Um, active job is great for that. My service object the active job thingy is maybe nice for that. Perhaps I've shut some light on the way to use Rails default, you know, stuff out of the backpack um, to do some of the service object stuff that might be going somewhere else. Um, it's true that when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but Rails is a bloody good hammer. <laughs> yeah, the number of times I get blamed and find out the perpetrator of a code monstrosity was me really, really bugs me. The thing I always try and remember now is that I'm writing code for other humans, and that other human might be future me, and I really don't want to piss him off. <laughs> and that's, and that's it.